I'm in the express lane at no frills, 12 items or less. And the Christmas tunes have already begun. It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. And I have three items, uh, just the necessities. Um, coffee pods, Pool Ranch Doritos, and Axe Body Spray. Like I say, the necessities. And I'm in a hurry, not that that makes a difference to how the world actually works. And there's this lady in front of me with a cart of 28 items. How do I know? Because I took the time to count every last one of them. And I gotta say, it's hard to do math when you're angry. Why didn't this checkout lady tell her that this is the express lane? Is she new? Is she trying to hurt me personally? It's okay, I'm a patient person. I'm a pastor. I'm, I'm a paragon of spiritual maturity. I'll be out of here and, you know, breaking the speed limit in no time. So, oh, the checker is done scanning her abundant mass of non-essential items. I can't even see if she has Cool Ranch chips. And it's almost my turn. Hold on a second. She's grabbing a, a wallet. and she, Oh, she's not grabbing a card? No? It's a, it's a change purse full of toonies. Are you kidding me? She's going to pay her $70 plus tab um, with toonies. I feel so lightheaded, I think I could faint in that moment. How dare you, miss? How dare you? If I had pearls, I would clutch them. Uh, we are constantly in a hurry, aren't we? We always need to be someplace other than where we're at right now. And we need to be there when? Right now. Yesterday. I don't think there's a time when this feeling, this tension, this anxiety is, is more acute than this time that we're coming into now, this Christmas season. Uh, even not me just saying that out loud, is anyone having a panic attack? Christmas season, what? <clears throat> we have this group of... of uh, Older young adults. Older young adults. Is that an oxymoron? Like baggy tights or real processed cheese? Um, anyway, their group uh, read a book together. And uh, Glenn told me how profound it was for them. Uh, John Mark Comer, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. And uh, he got me to read it. And it, it's the best book I've read in a, in a couple of years. Uh, another one of our small groups is studying it. Um, would anybody like this book? Did, did, would anybody read this book if I gave it to you? Yeah. Okay, oh, okay, okay. I've got my own. You've got your own? Oh, snap! <laughs> Sermon illustration right there, folks. Um, let me see those hands again if you, if you actually want to read. Okay, I'm going to look for the newest person that I know. Paula, bless Hello. you. Welcome to Hello. New Market Alliance Church. <clears throat> um, it, it's, I highly recommend it. It, it. it is both timeless and that I believe they are biblical, godly principles. It's also prophetic in the sense that I don't think there's a generation that has needed this instruction more. And, uh, and no season uh, needs a total reimagining of how to do it than Christmas. It feels like many of us are, are doing the holidays wrong, if I can be so bold. And maybe this year would be the start of us giving a better gift, the gift of presents. Presence with our families, presence with our relationships, uh, presence with ourselves, presence with Jesus, who, who this whole season is actually supposed to be about, right? Psychologists and, uh, and mental health professionals are, are now talking about um, uh, an epidemic in this modern world, and they even have a name for it. They call it hurry sickness, like sickness as in a disease. 
And here's some of the definitions so we're on the same page. Hurry sickness, a behavior pattern characterized by continual rushing and anxiousness. Uh, Hurry sickness, in which a person feels chronically short of time and so tends to perform every task faster and gets flustered when encountering any kind of delay. Here's one from, from Meyer Friedman, a cardiologist doctor. Hurry sickness, a continuous struggle and unremitting, unremitting attempt to accomplish or achieve more and more things or participate in more and more events in less and less time. Oh, by the way, Dr. Friedman came up with that definition for hurry sickness in the 1950s. It feels like it could have been written yesterday. Are you like me, uh, moving from one checkout line to another because it looks shorter? Uh, How about counting the cars in front of you on the 401 to try to get the fastest lane? Multitasking to the point of forgetting one of the tasks. Anybody? Let's get a little more uncomfortable. Uh, Do any of these symptoms resonate with you? Let's just take a little self-diagnostic test here, okay? Number one, irritability. You're annoyed way too easy. Normal things irk you. You find yourself testy with the closest people. Hypersensitivity. All it takes is just a minor comment to hurt your feelings. Restlessness, you you can't seem to relax. Workaholism, or or maybe nonstop activity. You don't need a a career to have that nonstop activity. Uh, It's about accomplishment and accumulation, even if it's obsessive house cleaning and errand running, you know, sunset fatigue where by day's end you have nothing left to give your spouse or your family or God. Emotional numbness. It's like you're, you're losing your capacity to feel someone else's pain or your own pain. Um, out of order priorities. You seem disconnected from your identity and your your calling how about lack of care for your body no time for the basics like exercise eight hours of sleep a non-fast food diet escapist behaviors You're, you're too tired to do what actually gives life to your soul so you turn to the easy distraction netflix scrolling uh porn booze Number nine, slippage of your spiritual disciplines. And, you know, in this ironic catch-22, the things that will genuinely give you rest for your soul, actually, they take a little more intention, a little more emotional energy, but you're letting them slip. And number 10, isolation. You feel, you feel disconnected from God. You feel disconnected from your own soul, even. So how did you score? I realize this is the new normal of speed in Canada, particularly where we live in the GTA. But folks, it's it's toxic. And hurry kills relationships. Love takes time, on the other hand. But hurry kills joy and gratitude and appreciation. People in a rush don't have time to to enter into the goodness of the moment. Hurry kills wisdom. Um, Wisdom is found in the slow, in the quiet. Hurry, I would argue, it kills the things that we most hold dear. Our spiritual lives, our health, our marriages and family, thoughtful work, creativity, generosity, you name, you name your value. And hurry is probably a predator of those things. I wonder how many of you feel like you're kind of half sleepwalking through life, half alive, half dead, more numb than anything else. I think the technical word is blah. 
It's like you're so busy with life that you're missing out on, on the moment. And what is life really but a series of moments? Now, play this pattern out, what you're living right now. Play it out, five years, 10 years, 20 years. Envision yourself at 40 or 50, 60. It ain't pretty. So as you look ahead to what this might do to yourself, you're gonna have to ask yourself, why am I in such a rush to become somebody I don't even like? I mean, is church even just a bunch of busy people coming together to listen to a TED talk and sing a bunch of songs and then go back to their over busy lives? When you leave this morning, uh, over the doorways are these engraved signs that you may or may not have noticed. They're so ubiquitous, I, I, I don't even notice them anymore. They went up years ago, long before my time, long before the previous pastor's time. They went up during NAC's first pastor's uh, regime. <laughs> Dave, David Brandon, some of you will remember and uh, sometimes I've thought, oh, it's time, you know, it's time to take those down. We'll put up something more befitting this era of Knack. Something like, you know, thanks for coming to church. Now go be the church. That's just, that was just off the top of my head. <laughs> Here's what it says so you don't have to crane your neck and look around. Beware the barrenness of a busy life. I, I think those signs need to stay up a little longer. Um, I think it's more applicable than ever. One, one of those older young adults I talked about was actually really challenged in this small group series that they did. And she made uh, some real changes in her life. And I want to invite Danita, if she'd come back up. And uh, every week, I would love to hear from somebody, maybe who is listening to this sermon series or who has read the book or is in a small group that has talked about this book, who um, maybe has decided to take some baby steps towards saying no to the rush and saying yes to the Jesus principle of presence. People who are deleting apps or cutting Disney Plus or just choosing relationships over business. So thanks for doing this, yeah, Danita. And, you. Uh, you know, we were talking about that thing that humans do, which is like when, when asked how you're doing, what do, you, what do people typically say? People always say, oh, I'm so busy. Yeah. And I feel for myself, I was even saying that at points, but I came to a realization of myself and maybe also thinking, maybe if I'm thinking it, other people are probably thinking it of, do you say I'm busy because there's pride in that? That people like to be busy. It's, oh, I'm doing this. I hung out with this person. Oh, I was chatting with this person for this many hours or whatever it yep. is. And people take that pride. And on the other end, it could be hurtful or it could be, oh, I'm not included. It's, it just makes you think and other people think. So I've now enjoyed saying, I'm just staying at home or I'm just spending time with my daughter or I'm going out for a walk. Or... You don't feel the need to sort of justify your, no. yeah, good for you. No. It's, it's once I thought, I'm like, you know what, just to release myself of that yeah. and expectations that other people might have on me, yeah. it was so freeing and it was like, this is what I want. This, it's like a breath almost. And I still struggle with it. It's not like a, okay, I'm, I'm good to go. I've got this down pat, not at all. It's working on it and trying not to stay busy or making a plan just to do maybe one thing a week instead mm. of bunching up all, all your stuff. Well, you, you picked an interesting time to actually uh, say no to the hurry culture because you're a fairly new mom yeah. and talk about busy. So, yes. so what are some things that you're doing to try to... Uh, push back against the culture of yeah. busyness? I found it was like technology. That is like at your fingertips, whether in your ear or on your wrist or just having your phone, um, TV, like anything. I found that for myself, it was so easy to like, oh, someone's texting me. And I used to take pride in texting someone back right away. 
And now I'm taking pride in not replying back right away. And there's a few people that know they can reach me whenever. They're in my like favorites, whatever family, and um, some friends. But and that like I put the don't disturb button on my yeah. phone is the best gift I have been yeah. given. And like you can customize them. So for devotions, it's abiding with Jesus. When Dallas is awake before I go in her room that button goes on. So no one can reach me unless certain people, or if you call me a million times, then it'll eventually come through. Um, but um, you, were, you were feeling like, um, I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to waste this time with Dallas by being on technology, yeah, right? I found that time was passing me by so fast and I didn't even know it. It was like five months have gone by and 10 months of now that she's 10 months old and it's gone by so fast. And like everyone has said, that's older than our generation. It'll go in the blink of an eye. It does. And yeah, so thank you for that. <laughs> um, but it's, it made me sad. And then it made me realize like, you know, I don't need to waste any more mm. time of feeling like I need to see this or what other people are doing or putting expectations on myself that I don't need to. I just need to live my life um, for my husband, my daughter, for God, and just focus on, on that time. Wow, good for you. And, but it, it does, it, maybe it means disappointing some people who are yeah. used to getting oh, you absolutely. back to them. It, it, it means having some boundaries. Oh, absolutely. There was some people um, that were frustrated that they couldn't reach me and it was just ex- explaining to them. But I think it's also super healthy yep. to have boundaries and to say, no, I'm sorry, I'm with, with my daughter. And I know some generations and some individuals do it differently. And if that's working for you, fantastic. Then that's working for you. But for me and my family, I'm wanting to focus on those moments and focus on my daughter. And Because you're only going to get it once. Give us one more tip. Maybe there's, a, maybe there's even a way to utilize technology to, to help create time. Uh, help create time. Well, so, so like, mm. I don't know, timers or... Uh, yeah, no, so, I, so for my phone, so for all my social media, so I actually work on social media. I do a lot of, like, I manage business accounts, yep. TikTok, Instagram, Pinterest, stuff so like that's, that. So that's tough. That's your job <laughs> yeah. and yeah. a distraction. But. And, it's, and sometimes when you're getting all those notifications, it's like, ooh, like this has this many thousand views. Like, that's exciting, and you're just so easy to dive into that. So outside of, like, when Dallas is asleep is the only time I'll work on mm. it. Um, or edit or put together videos or photos. But other than that, I have a 20-minute limit on Instagram, TikTok, Pinterest. And I sometimes you can like swipe it away, but I have it so it's like it, it shuts down, like I can't. That's barely I'm enough time to feel jealous of other people. But that's... <laughs> Sometimes I'm like, oh, like I'm looking at something and it's like, okay, maybe that's good that I don't scroll anymore. But no, sometimes it's... I struggle with it. And then sometimes I'm like, oh, you know what? I'm actually happy it's done for the day. And now I go by, with, or days are going by, I'm not always checking it. Wow. And it's like, not that, it's another expectation of, are you in the know? Did you know this person? Or did you know that person yes. did this? Um, so it's just like a, and I struggle, but I'm, I'm trying. I, I just want to affirm that. Like it, it's, I, I'm looking for baby steps, but these are really significant steps. So let's show our thank aff- affirmation. Thank you, thank you. Thank you Danita. My, my favorite, re- by the way, we'd love to just hear your own sort of baby steps of, of what you feel convicted about and uh, something about saying it maybe in front of people that gives you an extra measure of... of um, I don't know, accountability. Um, my favorite rendering of the classic Matthew 11 verse, uh, many of you are going to recognize, you know, come unto me all you who are weary. It's found in this message translation. And, and just see if this wording doesn't sound incredibly enticing to you. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. 
Ah, doesn't that sound glorious? Doesn't something in your soul long for that? Don't you feel weary? I I wonder if burdened would describe any of you today. Anybody feel this bone-deep tiredness, not just in your mind or body, but in your soul as well? The great Corey Ten Boom, I've quoted her a lot lately. She once said that if the devil can't make you sin, he'll make you busy. Even the psychologist Carl Jung had this little saying, hurry is not of the devil, hurry is the devil. And it's even, um, it's even how many of us responded today. Danina talked about it. How you been? Great to see you. Oh, yeah, just, just busy. Pay attention to who answers that way. It's across class and generations and ethnicity. College kids are busy. Young parents are busy. Empty nesters are busy. CEOs are busy. Baristas and nannies are busy. Canadians are busy. And I think the number one problem we will face in deepening our spiritual walk, in becoming a follower of Christ, is time. Now, there is a, there's actually a healthy kind of busyness where your life is full of things that matter, uh, not wasted with time fillers. You know, by definition, Jesus himself was, was busy. The problem isn't when you have a lot to do, it's when you have so much to do that the only way to do it is to hurry. I'd go as far as to concur with, with John Mark Comer in his book that this new speed of life isn't Christian. It's actually anti-Christ. And some of you might be old enough to remember uh, this Motown song, You Can't Hurry Love. Well, uh, different context, not a song about busyness, but the truth is you can't hurry love. Love requires time. Love, in effect, is time-consuming. Parents know this. Healthy couples know this. Hurry and love are incompatible. I dare say all my worst moments as a, as a father, as a husband, as your pastor, just as a human being are when I, I'm hurried, late, falling behind my unrealistic to-do list, trying to, to cram too much into a day. Um, you may not be able to see it. You might have to know me to, to, uh, to see the way my wife sees it, but I can ooze anger and tension and criticism and impatience when I'm hurried. It's the antithesis of love. Hurry and love are oil and water. They don't mix. And you've heard this Bible passage at every wedding, I know, but how does the apostle Paul, uh, he gives that great definition of love in 1 Corinthians 13. He starts by saying, love is patient. Uh, If there's a secret to joy, I think it's got to start with presence. Presence. Present in the moment. The more present we are to, to the now, the more joy we tap into. Love, peace, joy are at the heart of what Jesus is trying to grow in the soil of your life. And all three are just incompatible with hurry. You can't live in the kingdom of God with a hurried soul. No one can. It's not that I'm worried you and I are going to renounce our faith. That's not the danger here. It's actually more insidious. It's more subtle. I'm worried that busyness, distraction, consumerism makes us settle for a very mediocre version of our faith. Jesus invites us into something he calls the abundant life. And hurry is not a pathway to it. So, do you see what's at stake here? It's not just our mental health that's under threat, as if that weren't enough. It, what, it's more terrifying. Our spiritual lives hang in the balance here. And as much as I like the Matthew version of, of, verse, of, of Matthew 11, 
Let's just go to the traditional version. Uh, the, ma- the message took out some of those, those evocative words that I really like when, when, you know, it was quoted in the King James, for instance. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. So first of all, apparently Jesus has a yoke. Now, as many of you know, uh, this is what a yoke looks like from a, from a farmer's point of view. But a yoke was also a very common idiom in the first century for, for a rabbi's way of teaching the Torah. So, so Rabbi Eli has a, has a slightly different yoke than Rabbi Moshe. You know, they emphasize different things. Uh, they taught it slightly different ways. Their yoke was their particular way of teaching what it means to be human. Uh, how, how that applies to marriage and parenting and prayer and divorce and sex and money and government, all of it. A yoke is, is how you shoulder a load. And Jesus said he has an easy yoke. And for Jesus' apprentices, that's us, his disciples, you could say his yoke is really just organized around three basic goals. Be with Jesus, become like Jesus, and, and do what Jesus would do. It's, it's really the apprenticeship model that we call discipleship. And I think we're realizing in our hurry sickness that it's not something that can be fixed with a, a spa day or a treadmill desk or essential oils. Jesus' invitation is to take up his yoke, to travel through life at his side, learning from him to shoulder the weight of life, to move from anxiety and burnout to a life of of soul rest. But you want to experience the life of Jesus, you have to adopt the lifestyle of Jesus. We've lost sight of, of the fact that the way of Jesus is just that. It is a way of life. It's not just a set of ideas, what we call theology. It's not just a set of do's and don'ts, what we call uh, morality or ethics. Uh, I mean, it is that, but it's, it's so much more. It's a way of life based on how Jesus himself did life. Um, it's not just an orthodoxy, right, thinking. It's orthopraxy, right, living, It's a lifestyle, and your life is the byproduct of your lifestyle. And by lifestyle, I mean the rhythm and and routines that make up everyone's day-to-day, the way you organize your time, the way you spend money. You know, there's this saying in the the business world, um, every system is perfectly designed to get the results it gets whether positive or lousy. Anxiety, high stress, chronic burnout, little to no sense of the presence of God, inability to focus our mind, not abiding in Christ. If that's your system, there's something off in it. Something is off kilter. What's that off-quoted uh, definition of insanity? Uh, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. But that's exactly what we do. We get a vision of the kind of life that is possible in Jesus. We go to church or read a book or listen to a podcast. We catch a glimpse of the kind of life that we are aching for and then go back to the same old, same old. Rinse and repeat. Stress, tiredness, distraction. Insanity. It's insane. And Jesus is saying, just follow my way. Take in my 
habits and practices? Why do you think people all over the world, outside the church, inside the church, are looking for an escape, a way out from under the crushing anxiousness of life? Addictions, distractions, medications, not just substance abuse, not just porn, but eating, dieting, shopping, work, social media, ministry. But the, but the best the world can offer is, is a temporary distraction. That's why Jesus doesn't offer us an escape. What he's actually offering us is something better. The equipment, the tools, his yoke. Jesus was rarely in a hurry. Can you imagine a stressed out Jesus after a long day of ministry snapping at Mary Magdalene? You, I, you drop the hummus? Are you kidding me? He's like, Ugh, I think it's wine o'clock or, you know, it's got to be happy hour somewhere. Ugh. Can you picture Jesus talking to you and like sort of half looking at his phone? Oh, uh, yeah, no, right, yeah, yeah. Mm. Right, right, Le- leprosy, you say, huh? It's crazy, man, yeah. yeah. Uh, having this one-sided convert. no. Can you hear him saying, I would love to heal you right now, but I have a plane to catch. I'm speaking at uh, TEDx Jerusalem tomorrow. Here's Thaddeus, he's an apprentice of mine, and uh, he'll be happy to pray for you. Thaddeus, make sure and, and uh, give this nice lady one of our signed eight by tens. Jesus was <laughs> fiercely present He wouldn't just let anything or anyone, even a medical emergency, rush him into the next moment. You notice that? He was constantly interrupted too. Read the gospels. Half the stories are about interruptions. But he never comes off as agitated or annoyed. I'm embarrassed how agitated and annoyed I get. It's actually a good indicator of of the condition of your soul. Sometimes he would go away overnight or even just for a few weeks at a time to get away from the crowds and gather himself to God. He would often enjoy a long meal with friends, just creating space for depth of conversation. He practiced Sabbath. Uh, Then he turned around and he said, follow me, follow my ways. What does that mean? Um, I think it means to take his life and his teaching as a template for how you live in 2022, a a model, a pattern. So how would Jesus live if he were me? Wait, how would Jesus live if he were in me, which he is? Um, We wrestle for control of who's actually steering our life when Jesus is supposed to be in us. Stephen Covey said we achieve inner peace Peace when our schedule is aligned with our values. So you, you got to start with all your top priorities. Uh, have you heard of the, the big rocks illustration? Let's just play that real quick. This is uh, the spiritual discipline where you, you could put all the Netflix stuff in first. Uh, the, the small rocks, then you could put in eating. And, but when it gets to the important values, it's, they're not going to fit in this jar called your life. But what if you started by organizing the important things first? Non-urgent, but important. God, family, work, and then the necessary things. And then, look, all those extras actually fit, but you got to put the, the big rocks in first. There are um, monastic orders and sometimes entire communities who choose to do life together around what they call a rule. How many have heard the term a rule of life? Have you, have you heard that term? It's an old timey uh, monk term. And a a rule was a a schedule, a set of practices to order their life around, around the the way of Jesus 
and to do it in community. Uh, it was a way to slow down, a way to live in what matters, a way to abide. By the way, I gotta say, the two abide groups that, that I'm facilitating, highlight of my week, seeing people grow and connect with Jesus and hear from God. The, the word rule uh, comes from the Latin word regular, which literally means uh, a straight piece of wood. That's where we get ruler, right? But it also uh, came to mean trellis. Do you know what a trellis is? Let's, let's put that up. There, you, you didn't know you knew it, but it, that, it, that's, what it, that's what it is. It, it, it keeps the growing vine off the ground. Now, think of Jesus teaching on abiding in the vine. Uh, in John 15. It's, it's a structure to hold up the vine so it can, what? Bear much fruit. So that it can grow. What a trellis is to a vine, a rule of life is to abiding. If a vine doesn't have a trellis, it'll die. It'll get trampled on. And if, if your life with Jesus doesn't have some kind of structure to facilitate growth, man, it's going to wither away as well. And we're going to talk about what might be included in that structure, in that rule of life in the weeks to come. So I I really hope you stick with us. But following Jesus has to make it into your schedule. It has to make it into your practices and habits, or it just won't happen. Apprenticeship with Jesus, it will just remain an idea not a reality. But here's the thing, and if we're being perfectly honest, most of us are just too busy to follow Jesus. Or are we? How much time do you spend watching Netflix? How much time on social media? How much time shopping? Try logging every minute for a week see where it goes this week, I think you'll be shocked by some of the trivial things. Turns out we have to reallocate our time so that we can seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And on the very rare occasion that somebody genuinely doesn't have time for the practices of Jesus, maybe, maybe they're simply too busy to follow Jesus. Because the truth is, following Jesus is something we do. It's, it's a practice as much as it is a faith. It's an action as much as it is a belief. Like we said, don't all worthwhile relationships take time? Like your marriage, um, your spouse comes to you, ask for more time together, simply to enjoy each other and get on the same page. And they ask for, let's say, one date night a week, 30 minutes a day of conversation, basically the bare minimum. And if you say, oh, sorry, I just don't, I just don't have the time, especially when you've got 30 hours a week for TV and doom scrolling and TikTok and fantasy sports league, Anyone with even a modicum of common sense would say, uh, you've got the time, you're just not prioritizing it right. And so then maybe the hard question is, are you too busy to be married? So either you need to radically rethink your schedule or divorce is inevitable. I sure hope they would pick the former.